Okay, well, I am going to introduce to you the next speaker. He's a very special person to me, of course. Uh, but I will just a little bit because he told me to make the introduction short. Anyway, he was educated by Salishan priests uh, in his grade school uh, at uh, Boston, um, gone Boston. And then he went on to USD pre-med and finished uh, his medical education there. Uh, he trained at St. Luke's Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio for ENT, and then uh, had his fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic for head and neck and uh, facial uh, reconstruction surgery. I am very proud to tell you that he, um, when he took his boards, um, was in the 95th percentile. And so he was exempted from the oral exam. And I'm looking around, but I'm not seeing him. One of our other classmates who uh, trained in ENT, Dr. Tim Gabriel, also had this privilege. He is a fellow of the American College of uh, Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery. <coughs> Excuse me. A fellow of fatal plastic and reconstructive surgery. Because of his work, he was appointed, which is a difficult thing, uh, to be the board of governors of uh, uh, the Academy of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery. Uh, he was president of Northeastern Ohio uh, Society in Cleveland. And he also uh, was president of USD MAA Foundation last year. Um, he did community work as well. President of the Association of Philippine Physicians in Ohio and the Philippine uh, Society of Ohio. He is a Eucharistic minister and also sings in the choir of our church. So um, he told me, I probably should tell you this, his best accomplishment was marrying me. <laughs> I love you a message this morning saying just that. So we um, heartfelt gratitude for actually you marrying me. I present to you the love of my life. Dr. <laughs> years ago, uh, we gathered across the street at the Flamingo. We sort of uh, gave ourselves uh, our graduation. And uh, uh, you, you see this, uh, this, this medal, this, uh, this is our silver graduation medal. Uh, there's an asterisk in our, uh, in our school. Uh, not tell you that, but uh, there, we, we have, there are 38 uh, of us who gathered. There are, uh, there are uh, I think, two who have since passed away. May they rest in peace and make all the other classmates of ours who have passed away, about 15 or, or so, 60 passed away. May they all rest in peace. Um, supposed to say uh, patients with globus hystericus or global syndrome frequently have true dysphagia, meaning difficult to swallow it, true or false. Um, you, you, you think it out. I, I will just go to the post-test later. The prognostic nutritional index, or the PNI, is a proven applicable for evaluation of cancer patients only.
there is less risk of severe bradycardia and asystole by stimulating the left vagus nerve versus the right vagus nerve. Mahirap yan. I hope this, this works out. Um, so here we are. Uh, we are at the, uh, uh, our alumni convention. Um, and we're supposed to talk about the latest uh, update on, in medicine and surgery. But I chose uh, the topic of 50 years of medicine, picking a few innovations, contributions, and conclusions. What, what an oxymoron, right? Um, and magaya bang nako with what I have been able to accomplish. But uh, let's, let's just uh, put yourselves in perspective uh, during those days when we started up, uh, when we uh, were still training. Uh, and I hope that um, uh, what I show you uh, will convince you that what I, the few things I did was relevant then and could still be looked as uh, relevant uh, uh, in this uh, modern years of medicine. Um, my first work was in 1979, uh, uh, entitled Abnormal Esophageal Manometry in Globus uh, Hystericus. Uh, I was the primary author and I, I had uh, some senior authors with me. Um, Globus uh, Hystericus uh, connotes that this subjective sensation, which is usually in the suprasternal area, um, it, because there is no organic uh, cause, it is of uh, hysterical or neurotic origin. Of course, we don't know this, that, uh, that this really is, is, the, uh, is, is the reason, because most of these patients are not, they don't have gross hysterical personalities. Um, and actually, the, the answer is, they do not have true dysphagia. So all they come in with is they, they have this sensation there, but they, they may say, Doc, I cannot swallow. What do you mean? Can you eat what you want to eat? Yes. Uh, but uh, do you feel it when, when, you're, when you're swallowing? Doc, really? I, I really don't feel it. But in reality, when you get their history, they really feel that sensation when they're not doing anything. And they don't, they, 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 they don't, uh, uh, they don't have, they, they haven't lost weight. Um, so, Globus Hystericus represents 3% of adult patients seen by the otolaryngologist. They come to us, they're seeking help. They have that sensation, it's so real and vivid to them. And they, they, they uh, resent the fact that you told them, you tell them there's nothing wrong with you. Um, so uh, when I started looking at this, I, I said, uh, maybe uh, authors like John Purcell in 1707 was right. Global symptoms are not vain imaginations and groundless fancies occasioned by disturbance of the spirits of the brain. Some patients are pleased to say, but the, se but the, the real sensation actually is felt by the patient. He, he thought that the um, global sensation is because of contraction of the strap muscles against the thyroid cartilage. And I, I looked at the uh, different etiologies, and the, the different authors um, felt that it came, came up from as high as the maxillary sinusitis or a long uvula, Timor, Don Burgess and Matthew, right? And we always see these patients who they look at, they see their long uvula, they want us to, to, to cut it because that's the cause of the global sensation. Sometimes they talk us into doing that and we try to do it, simple procedure um, in the office, but uh, it's very frustrating. You try to do it at the local, you amputate it and then <coughs> cough. They swallowed the uvula already. <laughs> um, um, and so uh, we try doing, uh, try not doing, uh, cutting the uvula. Um, other sensations, osteophytes in the cervical spine. Boy, up by you probably have had done some some surgeries uh, removing the the, the osteophyte in the cervical spine because of globus, right? <laughs> but they insist that they. It's, but, but you can see that indentation there. It's in the, uh, in, it's in the post, post pharyngeal, posterior pharyngeal area, um, and they think they have, uh, they have, that's the cause of globus. And there are other things, because it's here, 
it, it was postulated that it's because of hypertonicity of the cricopharyngeal sphincter, right? Um, and then many goiters have been removed, but they still have globus sensations. Um, and and when, there are others who even said rectal polyp was a cause of the globus. <laughs> it went all the way down there. So uh, the, the esophagus uh, uh, starts where the pharynx ends. So it, it is guarded by the cricopharyngeus or the upper esophageal sphincter, and then it ends where at the, at the G junction, the um, the upper uh, the musculature of the upper thirds of the esophagus is skeletal or um, it's voluntary muscle, and then the lower uh, the lower thirds is uh, smooth muscle, involuntary, and then the, the middle thirds of the esophagus is a mixture of of, of skeletal and and, uh, and smooth muscle. So what, what did we do? What did we do in, with the esophageal manometry back in '79? Um, we were the only one in St. Luke's Hospital who had, had who, were, who offered the esophageal manometry uh, in Cleveland and even the Akron area. So, uh, but we were able to collect 12 patients who who, who wanted to be worked up. They had seen uh, so many other otolaryngologists, thoracic surgeons. They said, "Do something about our my globus." So what, what you have to do then, I, I don't know what, what, what they do right now is uh, you, you swallow a, a, um, a three, um, three catheters with a large space of 50 centimeters apart. The, with our study, you can, you can uh, measure resting pressures, you can do deglutition uh, pressure studies, and we, we uh, measure pH. And that was me then, 79. I had to, exp I, I had to volunteer and so, to convince people that uh, it, it's, it's a painless thing, I, I had to do it myself. And that, we called that then a micro, microcomputer. It was a, a microprocessor, because when I presented this, uh, we called it a microprocessor. See how, how big it is. Um, we, um, we gathered 12 patients, 10 were females, 2 were males. Um, and um, then this is the age, yeah, you see the, uh, the mean uh, age was 49. This, uh, by the way, correlates with the, with the, the first uh, um, uh, report of uh, Globus hystericus you can find in the Hippocratic Treatises. Hippocrates um, um, said that the uh, Globus sensation is exclusive to menopausal women. That was his, that was what he wrote. So they all had their physical examination, laryngoscopy, esophagoscopy, and we all did uh, rigid laryngoscopy and esophagoscopy then, either local or general. That's that's all how we could do it, and they had seen their esophagograms. Um, the normal pressure of the esophagus, resting pressure, is it's like the pleural pressure. It's in, in the chest. It's negative. It's subatmospheric. And this is a, a tracing of normal esophagus. You can see, uh, you can see um, I said shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, this, you see the progression of, uh, of, the, uh, of the peak uh, <laughs> of the peristalsis from distal to, to uh, from, <laughs> from proximal to distal. This, this, uh, this uh, catheter space uh, five centimeters uh, from proximal to distal. Um, and here's a, a, an abnormal tracing. You, you don't see the peristalsis, you see simultaneous repetitive contractions and, uh, and uh, elevated resting pressures. And uh, here, here again you see um, repetitive but low amplitude contractions. And what I want you to show, show it to you now is we have a pH meter and uh, here. Low battery now, uh, right? That's the pH meter. Maybe my classmates don't remember pH. Okay, it's alkaline, right? And when it's uh, it's low, it's uh, acid, right? So 
uh, there, it, bumabayan. Uh, so it shows the Lazarus of Fijial reflux. And uh, we focus on the cricopharyngeus, which is the upper uh, upper um, sphincter. We look at the, uh, the this is the contraction of the pharynx, and then the cricopharyngeus, uh, cricopharyngeus. The cricopharyngeus should should uh, should uh, relax at the right moment, so that the bolus from the pharynx goes down. Okay, um, but we found that the cricopharyngeal um, uh, pressure was, was normal, but there, there exists in some of them, uh, actually two of them, uh, the fact that the cricopharyngeus in this one, uh, unlike in here it's normal, it, there's premature, premature relaxation, therefore uh, the, 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 the uh, contraction of the pharynx uh, is, goes ahead um, and there is a dysfunction in the cricopharyngeus. If if you uh, uh, if you follow these patients, uh, most likely uh, they are the ones who would, uh, as they get older, would uh, uh, develop a, a Zenger's diabetes. So, what up, what up, the advancer. So, uh, in summary, uh, what, what we found was that 83% uh, of these patients had high resting pressures, and 872 of these patients had, uh, had uh, uh, disordered motor activity. So we go back to John Purcell's, it, it, our, our studies show that uh, there, these are probably not vain imaginations or grand, groundless fancies. I tried to look at back and see, uh, is there any evidence uh, that um, a sensation in the, in the body of the esophagus could, could be a, a referred sensation into the, uh, in the, soup, in the um, uh, proximal uh, esophagus or the pharynx. And there were uh, authors who had already uh, tried in inflating balloons at the different uh, levels of the esophagus. Um, eliciting a discomfort in the suprasternal area. So the take home from this study was, is that most likely the globus sensation, in the nervous, I think all of us in the nervous, you, you would feel something here, right? You, 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 it, it's, it's because of, of a non-peristaltic, you call it a spasm of the, um, of the esophagus, and it's just referred that. The cricopharyngeal sphincter, um, uh, pressure is normal, but there could be some patients who, who have a dysfunction, and uh, uh, patients, uh, some patients might have reflux. So, treatment uh, of uh, globus patients, uh, you can reassure them that uh, they have no cancer. Um, when they come to us, we, uh, uh, we do a complete head and neck examination, the flexible laryngoscope is very, uh, very. All of us have it now. And if Tom Burgos is still practicing, wants to take his wife for dinner, he would pass the flexible laryngoscope. Uh, laryngoscope. Um, and uh, during those days, uh, um, we all like Valium. Uh, Valium is good for seizures. It's good for relaxation. We we gave most of these patients Valium. Now we don't do that. Um, I I started to to uh, get. It. Uh, like uh, amitriptyline, uh, TCA, uh, give them 10 milligrams, they, they, they sleep well, they feel better, and, um, and then 10 milligrams, they don't get, gain weight. So um, then I, because of this study, I tried prokinetics, uh, Reglan, but then I, I read that, you know, pwede palang magkana, target dyskinesia, uh, so I avoided it. So, you know, nowadays, if you come to your, your otolaryngologist with this global sensation and you insist something, you need, it's just a, 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 you want a prescription, especially if you say, I'm clearing my throat or, um, and then I, I'm coughing a little bit, what do they give you? They give you a, a PPI. You know, PPI, yeah. Quantaprosol, uh, or Omeprosol, Espasol, uh, uh, or, or, or a, or a or an H2 blocker. 
So, you know, I, now, this is my bragging here now. Uh, Fred Cross um, was um, one of the earliest guys who, who invented the, um, the disc oxygenator in, in, um, uh, for the heart lung machine. And he's the one who I use his, uh, his laboratory for this. And he said, Dr. Flores, you got a lot of mileage from your, um, from your paper. Um, and Dr. Cross was a big wasp, you know, but he liked me. Um, so I, the first thing I did, I, uh, I uh, became a guest uh, resident uh, to the Cleveland Surgical Society. Well, I'm by it. Uh, so then I, then I, uh, I entered the paper at, the, at our local St. Luke's Hospital, third place lung, fifty dollars lung. Then I, I still, uh, they said uh, I was in the radar screen. The American College of Surgeons said, "Why don't you enter your paper in the essay, the, in the residence uh, essay contest?" Uh, won an honorable mention, sixty dollars. <laughs> then I, uh, this was the most competitive thing. The Northeastern Ohio Otorhinology uh, Maxillofacial Surgery Society. Oh, they were so competitive. But I, I came from the smaller program, St. Luke's Hospital. I competed with, with the Cleveland Clinic residents and the Case Western residents. Yeah, better not walk up first price, $100. That was big in 1979. Um, but, so, but, but then I, I said, ano, minor league in Lamian. Gusto ko ano, major league. So I, uh, I, uh, I entered my papers and I was invited uh, by the American Broncos Biological Association. I, I presented in, in Vancouver. And in May 1981, and it, it gave me automatic uh, uh, publication of the, the annals. And the last, uh, the last one was, I, I, I will show you the documentation. The American College of Surgeons doesn't have $60. And, and, and that, was my, that was my invitation to Vancouver. I got a free, uh, um, free hotel and, and everything. And, uh, that's the annals, and then this is the last one. See this? I got 40, 40 uh, Dutch marks for it. Uh, so, uh, let me go to the, the second topic. Um, if you treat uh, head and neck uh, cancer, um, you run into a lot of complications. Uh, could potentially run into a lot of complications. Um, most of them had uh, uh, received radiation, chemotherapy, um, or, or, or a combination of this, and uh, you end up with complications. So it, it, it's because they had complications, they they'd lost weight, their nutrition is bad. So we, we, we said, you know, maybe we should look into these patients that we, we operated on. Can we do something about it? And this is a patient who, who had a, oh, uh, a laryngectomy, and it had a, a fistula, this fistula may last for, a few days, a few weeks, a few months. Eventually, it will uh, it will close. But this poor poor gentleman uh, had a laryngectomy, but because shit happened, you know. um, it, uh, uh, everything uh, uh, everything fell apart. And you know what what's in here? This one. That's a carotid artery that's getting exposed. You know, a true story. You know what what happened with these patients? And this was this was quite common then. You know what, what the, who complains more is the is the is is um, um, housekeeping because they, they have to clean the uh, the blood in the ceiling uh, because when, when this when this ruptures it it squirts all over the place and um, so and the mortality rate for uh, carotid blood is, is up to fifty percent. So we um, we looked into uh, applying a prognostic and nutritional index. The, the guys from the uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, if there's a general surgeon here, that you remember Dudrick, uh, Dudrick he, he was the father of uh, uh, TPN, total uh, nutrition, uh, uh, nutrition yeah, TPN. And his group uh, had uh, formulated already uh, a, uh, this was at the Cleveland Clinic, you see how, how old this, uh, this car is. I'm not telling you a lie. <laughs> uh, so you, you need some data to to to, um, um, to calculate the, the PNI 
we look at the, uh, you see how, how much subcutaneous um, uh, fat they still have in it, serum albumin, serum, serum transfer, and then you, look, you test for delayed hypersensitivity. So there, that's, that's a skin test, and those are the trichophyton, uh, mom's candida testing. So I, I won't, I won't uh, go into detail, but um, uh, you, we use the, the PNI um, formula from the University of Pennsylvania, and we uh, uh, did some uh, prospective studies. We uh, gathered 29 patients. We did the PNI on them. Um, and this is, uh, this is the age distribution. And we looked at the, the complications. Uh, we divided into minor complications, uh, hematoma, cellulitis, abscesses, small fistulas that did not need any, um, need any uh, uh, secondary procedure. Some of them got, got pneumonia. Very, very, but not uncommon for head and neck cancer patients. And then uh, we looked at the major complications. Death from surgery, fistulas, uh, wound separation, skin flaps, and major artery, uh, artery uh, exposure blowout. And uh, so, you know, with this patient who had failed radiation, the uh, complication rates almost 50%. This is an honest, honest study. We, we it's uh, fifth, almost 50%. Uh, uh, seven had uh, major complications and eight had minor complications. And we looked at the distribution of the complications, of course. Patients with stage one and two, they, they needed less surgery, so less chance of complications. None of them had major complications. Um, and this is the distribution, the, we, this is the, the PNI. Um, the higher the PNI, using that formula, the more, uh, the more uh, risk of complications. You could see that 50% uh, would have a major complication and then None of them, not, uh, and this yellow is uh, for no complications at all. Uh, and this is the, this we, we classified, we looked at the stage three and uh, all the more, if you need a bigger operation, stage three, the more, the more chance that you, you can get a major complication. So the conclusion from this study was, uh, um, if you are, you have, you have a PNI greater than 20%, and uh, you, you have a, a higher stage, there's a more chance of, uh, of uh, complications. Now, where does this PNI uh, stand now? Oh, no, this is... Uh, so, when, uh, so when I did this, um, uh, I was able to present this uh, paper at the annual um, meeting of the American College of... American Society of Head and Neck Surgery. Uh, I got a, uh, I got a recording in the audio digest. That was a big deal. And then I, I, I had the ar archives of, uh, of otolaryngology. Uh, yeah, uh, this is my invitation. It was the breakers at the. Um, I'm the last speaker anyway. I tell you, this was at the Palm Beach. Uh, I had to take my whole family there, and I, I went out and I said I was looking for McDonald's, and they said, "What do you mean?" Palm, this is Palm Beach, you're looking for McDonald's? Go across the, uh, across the bridge and go to West Palm Beach, you might find McDonald's. <laughs> and this was the audio digest. There are uh, Toribio Flores, I was with all these heads of the department. Uh, uh, John, uh, John, Ma Michael Johns became uh, the dean of the College of Medicine at, uh, at uh, John Hopkins. Um, so where does PNI stand now? They, it has, uh, it's, it's very useful now, but they, they change it. Uh, all you need now is, um, is serum albumin and lymphocyte count. So, and then gen name, uh, uh, no, uh, um, nutrition, and then lymphocyte count is a measure of, uh, of uh, immunity. You, you know, the, the shifting of, uh, of, uh, of medical oncology is more to immunity. Um, so, it, it, it's, it's reciprocal now. So, when you get the PNI now with this, with this formula, the lower, the lower, uh, the number, the more malnourished, and then so the higher number now, uh, the better the prognosis. And it's it's being a, it's it's uh, used for, especially for advanced uh, uh, solid tumors. They they can uh, uh, they can um, uh, uh, predict uh, the outcome with this, especially esophageal cancer, uh, even GOI and uh, cancer. Uh, it's used as a bio uh, bio make uh, bio make. <laughs> 
by a marker, by a marker, by, by a marker for, especially for breast cancer. So if you have a, a, a high PNI, if, if they're debating whether you need radiation, they'll go more to radiation because they, 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 they show that uh, your prognosis will be better. Very use, this, this PNI is, 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 is used a lot in, in the Chinese literature now. Even for, uh, for acute heart failure, you get admitted there, you know, you, you think that the, you're, uh, with heart failure you have pedal edema, uh, pulmonary edema, but you, you forget that the, you have edema of the gut. You have edema of the gut, the gut cannot absorb all, all those nutrients. And even, it's even used by the Chinese for as a predictor for outcome for uh, uh, cardiac surgery. And they, this is a, uh, the, the picture of, the, of the, one of the buildings at the Cleveland Clinic uh, now. Uh, and I want to make sure that this thing works. This is my last topic. Can I make sound? along with therapy are helping more people than ever overcome depression, but they don't work for everyone, and that can lead to desperation. I'm actually uh, an attempted suicide survivor, which is not something I'm proud of. Janet Gildner wants the world to know the toll depression can take. Medications didn't help her. In fact, dealing with the side effects made her more depressed. Feeling like she was, quote, suffocating, Janet tried to take her own life. The day that I decided to lay down in front of an oncoming train, I just needed to escape that. Janet lost a leg but survived and is now grateful to be alive. Her psychiatrist, Dr. John Worthington of Abington Memorial Hospital, is trying something new. It's an implanted pacemaker-like device called VNS, the vagus nerve stimulator. It's been used for about eight years to control epileptic seizures. During that time, doctors saw something interesting. Even patients who had no improvement in their seizures reported feeling less depressed. Dr. John O'Reardon is also using VNS at Penn. Here's how it works. The pacemaker is implanted under the skin in the chest near the collarbone. A thin wire attached to it runs up to the left vagus nerve. The pacemaker generates mild intermittent signals to activate areas of the brain that regulate mood. 80% of the time it's doing nothing sitting there. 20% of the time it's on and it's uh, stimulating. The VNS is an option when medication and cognitive therapy don't work or stop working. Doctors say it does not have the troubling side effects of some drugs. There's no drowsiness, there's no nausea, there's no headaches, um, they're not having tremors. It doesn't cause sexual dysfunction. It doesn't cause some of the cognitive clouding or dulling we get on some of our medications. One side effect VNS can cause is a slight change in a person's voice when it activates. It's going off right now, so my throat, my throat is worse. But the stimulator signal can be adjusted. We can turn it right down and get rid of the side effects, uh, you know, very, very rapidly. VNS is not a cure, but offers people with the most severe depression a 50-50 chance of improvement and the hope of feeling normal again for the first time in years. I'm Nina Brickman, and that is Health Check App. I, I don't claim to, uh, that this, I'm the innovator here, but I, I was one of the earliest implanters uh, of uh, the vagus nerve stimulator in, in uh, Cleveland. But let, let me review to you, uh, you know, it's, it's past, so one, oh, it's 1.15 already. Um, the, the history of vagal nerve stimulation started uh, uh, really 2,000 years ago when, uh, when a patient uh, would have a, uh, a focal seizure. I think the one they, they taught us, they were, these were Jacksonian, same as Jacksonian's uh, seizures, right, boy? I'm up, yeah, yeah. So uh, what Galen did, he, he, uh, he would uh, put a tourniquet around this, uh, this uh, seizuring uh, extremity, and what he's, he's doing is he was setting a, a, an afferent, a stimulus back to the uh, 
uh, to the brain so that it will start, uh, it may abort the seizure. Uh, I will not uh, go through all of this now, but let me just point out to you uh, that the um, uh, VNS was uh, first approved in the United States for epilepsy in 1997, and then uh, 2005 was uh, when the approval was, uh, was given for depression. So what's the rationale of VNS uh, in uh, psychiatry? Um, well, when they looked at these uh, patients who had uh, the implant uh, for seizures, it, whether the VNS worked and reduced the number of seizures, what they found that most of these patients, their depression got better. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's the basis for how they got approval for, for VNS. Uh, this is the jargon of psychiatrists, major depressive disorder. You know, I, uh, the way I understand this is uh, there, there, there are many uh, options for the treatment of depression. You may start them on one drug, maybe 50% get better. You, you add a second drug or you substitute the second drug. You go to the third, fourth, fifth drug, but only 70, 75% get better. Get better. So um, these are the patients who uh, are, are called, uh, are, uh, uh, are diagnosed with treatment uh, resistant depression. Um, when, when the VNS is, uh, is implanted, uh, the largest response is seen in the first, uh, it's my girlfriend. Um, the, 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 uh, the, they, they respond within the first quarter, and the response increases through the third and 12 months as they are followed. The response rate is about 32%. The, the VNS is well tolerated, and, and their most adverse events are reduced over time. Where is VNS not recommended? I don't know about this. Maybe Louis Ignacio can tell us what rapid recycling bipolar disorder is. It's not recommended for that. If there's psychosis, it's not recommended. Substance abuse, not recommended. S significant suicidal patients. If you need a rapid response and the patient says he's going to kill himself, maybe you go to the ECT route or do something else. Don't rely on VNS to, uh, to cure the, the patient. Um, so when you look at the, uh, the options of treatment, there is pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy, and uh, what we call neuro uh, neuromodulation. ECT, we all know, all know about ECT, and VNS is one of those, uh, um, one of those um, um, uh, 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 choices uh, for neuromodulation. Uh, who, who can um, implant a VNS? Anyone who is familiar with the, uh, with the anatomy of the uh, carotid sheath? Otolaryngologists had the neck surgeon, the vascular surgeons, neurosurgeons, but the otolaryngologist does the best, best job. Not even Boyaba can do it as good as the uh, otolaryngologist. Um, and then the, the, but the psychiatrists are, are the ones who send these patients to me. Uh, and then they follow them up, they, they do the adjustments, I'll show you, uh, for, I'll be done in five minutes or so. Can, uh, they, they do the uh, adjustment uh, of the computer. And the, the battery for, uh, for, the, uh, for depression, it could last up to 10 years. For seizures, because they, they, they need a, a more, more amplitude, more, more frequency, uh, it, it may last only for five, four or five years. And, the, um, and uh, the, the vagus nerve, uh, it's the longest uh, cranial nerve, but it has a, um, it, it, the, there's a difference between the right and the left. The, the left uh, vagus nerve is, is more uh, afferent, it's more afferent. Even the cardiologist doesn't know this. The, the, the right, the, the right uh, it is more efferent to the SA node, but the, the, there's less chance that you, if you, if you, uh, uh, Attack on the on the uh, left of vagus um, that you will end up with uh, a systole. So we and and this vagus uh, has a, a lot of uh, projections in the a lot of projections in the in the in the brain 
and the locus cerulus, which is the major source of norepinephrine, and the raphe nuclei, major source of serotonin. So when we stimulate the vagus, there's more concentration production of um, norepinephrine and serotonin. So these are the same uh, antidepressant drugs, uh, SSRA, SSRI, by SSRA. Um, and then, um, and this is PET scanning when, uh, during uh, PNS stimulation. There's alteration in the uh, uh, cerebral blood flow in areas which are implicated with mood regulation, like the thalamus, the hippocampus, the insula, etc. And this is the uh, this is the device. Um, the it's it's more than the battery. It's a it's a uh, it's a pulse generator. It's a, it's a bipolar leads. Um, so we we wrap this uh, bipolar leads uh, around the uh, the vagus cervical vagus. And the 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 stimulus is not a, it's not shocking the brain. It's just showing uh, it's just stimulating the. Um, setting action, action, action potentials uh, through the vagus. And the normal uh, uh, setting is used so the um, uh, um, third and so every, every 30 minutes. And uh, there, then the, there's that, uh, uh, there, there, there's the, um, uh, um, the, the, the paddle, uh, the paddle that's that uh, with the computer that will uh, that will adjust the settings of the uh, of the pulse generator, usually done by the psychiatrist. And uh, this is this will go very fast. This is the head, uh, head clavicle. We, as I told you, we do it exclusively in the in the left side. Make the incision around the cricoid level. There's the clavicle, and then. We make a pocket in the in the chest. It's it's like a pacemaker, um, but I I never use this axilla because I I taku taku sa ano yung papawisan and whatever and, and I I figured kahit na sexing ano sexing uh, 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 bikini lalabas pa rin yung ano yung uh, the, the, so I I just make my incision about about two centimeters below the the clavicle. Uh, this is the incision exposing the um, the the vagus and then the incision for the uh, chest uh, chest pocket and we tunnel the uh, the leads bipolar leads and this is the pulse uh, pulse generator and then we we uh, do intraoperative uh, uh, testing make sure that the leads are, are not fractured and uh, there you go uh, it's uh, when I did my first it took about two and a half hours and then uh, as I did more, hour and a half or so. Um, and then we provide them with a magnet. You, most, most of you know about magnets. You, if you want to abort the, uh, the, the VNS, you can just put a magnet and it will, uh, it will stop it. Um, so I, what I did is I looked at my um, first 10. I, it's very hard to, to quantify, uh, quantify depression. And, and I, you know, I, I ended up, I was like a, perhaps like a cardiac surgeon, the cardiologist says, you know, do a bypass and they just do the bypass. I just, I just did the surgery. But I, I, I tried to look back and, uh, and uh, uh, what, what, what were the, uh, uh, what, what was the profile of these patients? Did they have ECTs before that? And uh, what was the outcome? So the first one I did, he was on three different medications. I don't know if this was three, or, or it was on the third medication. He had been, uh, uh, had major depression for 15 years. Uh, I think I mishandled the vocal, the vagus nerve. He was hoarse for about uh, six months. So I, I looked at the other, other things. Uh, they said, well, I am better. They, they complained of that hoarseness, which uh, would occur every, every 30 minutes. And uh, uh, let's look at, uh, this one had 90 ECTs before I implanted it. And then after that, what well, happened ECT? This one had eight ECTs. Um, and this is, the, again, the, I tried to look at the, uh, how many medications they were on before. And it was very hard to, uh, to get it from the records. 
this is not, of course, not a very scientific way of uh, assessing its efficacy. So uh, again, um, I, I felt that I was helping the patients. Um, so um, you can still do uh, ultrasounds in the neck on the patients with VNS. This is a little drawback, um, maybe a bigger drawback. You cannot do an upper body MRI unless if you're very cautious. Um, and, they, they, and they can still have an implantable pacemaker, defibrillator, they can still have a mammogram, and they can still have, uh, have ECTs. Um, and uh, the VNS is unaffected by the microwave, metal detector, cell phones. Um, this was uh, what happened then. Why did I stop doing this? In May 2007, the CMS was still, still FDA approved decided that there was insufficient evidence to conclude that VNS is reasonable and necessary for the treatment of, uh, for TRD. So, I had no more psychiatrists uh, to send them to me. The psychiatrists will make money if you, you know, they, they, they follow them up every month and cha-ching, cha-ching, they, they, uh, they, adjust this, uh, they adjust this computer. Uh, it was lucrative for them. Um, but then, after the, 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 the company changed uh, names for, uh, for a couple times. Now they're, um, they're doing a very controlled uh, uh, study for, uh, for the efficacy of the VNS and TRD. They approve it, but it's very regulated now. Um, this is one of my last slides. So I to, to uh, implant uh, 18 of them for TRD. Uh, make your judgment. Only one asked me to to explant it. Uh, only one explant. So maybe they were satisfied. Uh, then I, I because they, they kind of knew my name. They, I, I start, they started referring uh, patients with seizures for me. So I did about about twenty of them, and uh, and I started to realize. And I'll be honest with you. Um, when I started doing this. Um, I, we didn't emphasize the need for MRIs. Now, in 2023, what's the likelihood that we would get an M need an MRI? It's almost it's almost likely that during your lifetime you get an MRI, right? So even if you explant the VNS, and this is where you have to be careful, and this is the same for the hypoglossal thing. Even if you explant it, you cannot remove the entire lead around the you leave you leave the lead there. And it could heat up if, uh, with, with an MRI. So there is almost a lifetime contraindication to, uh, to an MRI for patients, uh, uh, patients who, who have an, an implant, hypoglossal implant. So that's, that's, a, that's a drawback. Um, and, and I think we did not explain all of this uh, to, to patients then. Um, but but it's, you can still do the MRI, but they have to be cautious. But patients might go to the ER, and then they say, oh, you need an MRI. They, they get it, and they, they, but they still have that little bit of a, of a lead around the vagus. This is where I, this is one of the uh, community hospitals of, of Cleveland Clinic. There's, this is where I spent most of it, the Marymount Hospital. Um, now, a little a tidbit about it. The FDA has uh, approved uh, some transcutaneous VNS. I just got this from the end, uh, from the Ginocle Colando. Uh, and, um, uh, it could cost anywhere from uh, seventy-six to seventy-six dollars to thirteen hundred dollars. This is the insert that Truvada, and it claims that the v the VNS can make you feel better, calmer, think clearer, and sleep better. Now let's go back to our post listening questions. Patient, patients with globus er, globus uh, sensation frequently have true dysphagia, meaning difficulty swallow. False. They really don't have a, a true dysphagia. They just feel that, that sensation. The prognostic nutrition index is, a, is proven applicable for evaluation of cancer patients only. False. There is less risk of severe bradycardia asystole by stimulating the left vagus nerve versus the right vagus nerve. True. True. We, we do the surgery only on the left side. Thank you very much.
Thank you. We have